And anytime somebody tells that to me, I'm like, you're not, you shouldn't be an entrepreneur. If you can't look at it and say, hey, I'm going to do this for the next five and feel comfortable with that as like a journey of your career, then don't, don't start. What surprised you most about this last year? How little I feel like I value the classes and how much I value impromptu relationships mm -hmm. uh, that I have with people. GMAT or GRE? GMAT. What was your score on the GMAT? I got a 730. I wanted to do consulting and I was pretty devastated when I couldn't get uh, a job at one of these big three. Every time I thought I knew what I wanted to do and then ended up somewhere else, it ended up being better for me. Any moment that I feel disappointed in how something happened, I kind of just look at it and say, hey, what am I going to think about this in five years? to Cherie's Corner, a podcast where we dive into the topic of careers and hear from my friends and guests who are killing it in the business world so we can learn from their lessons, their wisdom, and their mistakes. I'm your host, Cherie, and currently I'm a business school student at Stanford University. Previously, I've held roles in tech and venture capital. In this episode, I interview my Stanford classmate, Chad Janis. Chad is a serial entrepreneur who's now working on his third startup. We talk about the lessons he's learned in finance and entrepreneurship, his three-week MBA application process, and yes, that is very quick. And finally, Chad provides a different and maybe unpopular opinion about Stanford curriculum and classes. He didn't find the classes in the first year to be exciting or enlightening. Rather, he found more value in the network and meeting classmates. Let's get started. I'm Chad Janis. I grew up in Dallas, Texas. I was born about 20 minutes away in San Jose. Growing up, I didn't realize it at the time, but all of my mentors, I was in Boy Scouts, as well as part of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, Mormons. All of them were consultants. Uh, so BCG, McKinsey, and Bain. Uh, there's a good contingent of consultants out in Dallas. Graduated from high school, went out to BYU, Brigham Young University. While I was there, I started to do accounting, thought that was the right path for me because that's what my dad did, and then came across finance and then came across consulting from these mentors. And then they told me, hey, you should also look into investment banking. So then I went down that path and ultimately landed a job at an investment bank out in New York. Did that for a year, hated it, hated it, like really hated <laughs> it. I do not remember that year of my life. Quit to go run a business for a year. After running that business for a year, I moved to Boston with my wife, where I worked in growth equity. Did that for three years, mostly in the consumer space. Left that to start a business just before business school. How were you able to figure out what was the right path for you? And do you feel like you've figured that out now? Yeah, it's interesting. Looking back, I wanted to do consulting. And I was pretty devastated when I couldn't get uh, a job at one of these big three. But as I've come to see in my like six years since graduating, uh, not that long, but Every time I thought I knew what I wanted to do and then ended up somewhere else, it ended up being better for me. So for example, um, Summit Partners, where I worked as a growth equity investor, great experience. I don't think I would have gotten that if I had done consulting. And so at the time I was like, hey, like this is where I want to end up. I want to be an investor. Consulting is probably the best path to get me there. Went to Lazard, ended up getting this um, opportunity with Summit. And looking back, you know, I was really grateful that I don't remember that year of my life at Lazard because it ultimately got me to something that I learned to love. I really like that story. What is the takeaway there? Or like the learning is that like one door closes, like five more open. I think for me, the big takeaway that I, that I live by today is like, it, it doesn't matter. Like let life play out. Mm -hmm. um, in the moment, you think like a little speed bump is massive. But then looking back, uh, you constantly realize like ha actually that was really great. And here's what I got out of that. So I think for me, it's more of like any moment that I feel disappointed in how something happened, I kind of just look at it and say, hey, what am I going to think about this in five years? Mm -hmm. You know, I guess we'll see. Did you do a mission? I did. Yeah. Where did you go? The best mission in the world. Uh, it's actually, I don't think that's a disputed fact. <laughs> I served it. It's called the Alpine German speaking mission. So it's basically the Alps. So you've got lower Germany, all of Austria, the uh, top part of Italy, so the Dolomite region, mm -hmm. and then Switzerland. Could you give a brief explanation of what that is yeah. and, what, and what you did there? So missions are two-year um, service opportunities. And what you do is it's actually a pretty rigid schedule. Uh, you get up at like 6.30, um, you study the scriptures, uh, both independently and with your companions. So you always have a partner with you. 
and you would study independently the scriptures, both the Bible and the Book of Mormon, which is similar to the Bible, but uh, it takes place in North America versus Middle East. Then you'd go out and try to find people who are interested in learning. That can take place via knocking on doors. I, most of the time, would just stop people on the street. So you walk up to somebody, give them a compliment. They're more open <laughs> to talking, as you can imagine, I think. You talk to them, and then if they were interested, you'd set up a time to come by their house and, and teach more. Most recently, you mentioned starting your own company before the GSB and having a few stabs at entrepreneurship. What was that journey like and how are you taking your learnings and applying to what you're doing now? The first time I stumbled into entrepreneurship, I sort of fell into it. It was more of, a, hey, I do things and there's this problem I see and I'm just going to like fix it. The first business I started was a flight aggregator, kind of like kayak.com or Google flights, but you would book with points instead of cash as the currency. I was writing a blog about personal finance. I wrote about travel hacking and how it saved me money as a college student. And the email subscription list went up, went up pretty fast overnight. So I was like, okay, you know, there's something interesting here, lean into it. And so I ended up leaning into that, continued to write about travel hacking, figured it's actually really difficult and people can mess up their credit scores. So I ultimately designed this app to make it possible for people to have less friction and be able to enjoy sort of these life experience. I didn't grow up in a very entrepreneurial family. So ran that for about six to 12 months, grew it to only about a hundred thousand of ARR. Um, so not, not big at the time. Um, it's like a 90% margin business and ultimately thought at the end of it, when I was going to summit partners, um, didn't even think about selling it right like that. I was very naive. So just shut it down, moved on. And then the second business I started, essentially we're trying to make influencer marketing as frictionless as every other marketing channel. We were trying to help match influencers and brands programmatically, ultimately some extenuating circumstances that would take probably hours to explain, we decided to sell the business last year. One of the biggest learnings I've had and that I see constantly from people who want to start something is they're like, hey, you know, I want to run this for like six months or like 12 months and see if it works. And anytime somebody tells that to me, I'm like, you're not, you shouldn't be an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. Like if you can't give yourself, if you can't look at it and say, hey, I'm going to do this for the next five and feel comfortable with that as like a journey of your career, then don't, don't start. And it's unrealistic to expect that in six months, You've got this like home run company that's growing super fast. It could happen, but um, I just think you're setting yourself up for essentially a wasted year where you then look back and are like, eh, you know, maybe doing a hundred thousand of ARR. It's not big enough. Are you saying that people need to have a five year runway? You'll figure out the runway as you go, but I think you have to psychologically come to terms that like, you know, your career is 30, 40 years. And I think it's really hard for people, especially when you're early in your career and you've looked at maybe like two years of work experience to say, mm -hmm. I'm comfortable with that being five of my seven years of my career, even if it fails. Yeah. Um, and I think that's a really, really hard psych psychological thing for people to get behind. It's like, is this a problem that I feel passionately enough about that I can see myself devoting five years to? Totally. Do I like talking to these types of customers? Can I imagine myself like diving into this for five years? Exactly. Yeah. Like, would that make you happy at the end of the five years, even if it didn't work to look back and say, like, I'm proud of that, you know, 80% mm. of my career was working on this problem. Even if you're not rich, even if you don't have like a great outcome from it. For people who are coming from like IB or a finance background, like what should they hold on to that they can bring into entrepreneurship? You learn to just grind. You learn to like work really, really, really hard constantly. I think that brings with it uh, issues of prioritization, right? Like how important is this task that I'm doing? You actually get really good at the analytical side of things. And I would, I would also say there's like so much time in investment banking spent around refining like an individual slide that you take to the client. And at the end of it, you put together this slide and you'll literally spend like three weeks refining that slide, cutting it down. So at the end of the day, it's like a very clear message to the client where they look at it and immediately pick up what the slide is supposed to say. So I think that was something that I've taken, not just into investing, but also into pitching investors for my own companies. Pretty boring. <laughs> what did you want to get out of an MBA? Yeah. Graduated BYU back in 2017. And I was like very certain then that I wanted to get an MBA. So I took the GMAT thinking, hey, this will last for five years was loving my experience. So there was Lazard, this company I started, and then Summit Partners. I was really enjoying my experience at Summit Partners, and I still really do enjoy being an investor, particularly in growth equity. Summit has this like very uh, rigid program of three years associate, 
one and a half year senior associate and the VP. I was doing very well at Summit and told them I don't want to do the senior associate track. Like, I feel like I've done a good job. And they ultimately said, hey, like we've never like let somebody hop the senior associate track. Like, you have to do it. Or you can go get your MBA, your choice, and come back as a VP. So it's like, hey, do I like work for a year and a half or do I go have fun for a year and a half, two years? Um, so ultimately, that was the impetus of, hey, like maybe I should reconsider going and get, getting my MBA. Went through the application process, and I think as I as I did that, it got more exciting to me thinking about the people I would meet, um, the experiences I would have, the time I would have as well to like work on new things. And I think one other aspect that I was excited about is like personal experiences and personal things that I wanted to work on for myself. Um, like for example, I th I think the MBA is a really great opportunity to step back and say like, what are the things in my life that I don't love right now? Mm -hmm. How do I sort of circumvent or fix those things in this next two years? So for me, one thing that's been really big is, hey, how do I, how do I pull back on work and put some balance behind, you know, I have a son who's 18 months. I want to spend at least two hours a day before he goes to bed, hanging out with him so that, you know, I am present in his life. Mm -hmm. um, and so having that balance and taking that time has been something that I've worked on at the NBA. And I don't think people typically think of those things when they think about the MBA, but like everybody has some aspect of their personal life and I think that they want to work on. And I think the MBA gives you an opportunity to focus and lock those things in before you begin the next journey of your career. Yeah. So does that mean you'll be going back to Summit Partners afterward? No, okay. not planning to go back. Were they, were you considering sponsorship? I had sponsorship, turned it down. Oh, dang. Yeah. Kind of a long story, but ultimately I think the headline <laughs> is I don't like Boston. So even when I talk to recruiters, I always say like happy in any area except for Boston. So do um, you hate Boston? I do. <laughs> yeah, I actually don't like Boston at all. So like when I left, the typical check size that we'd write is like 250 to 600. Mm -hmm. At that point, it's like, these are really big businesses. You're kind of a buyout firm. Mm -hmm. You're not really growth equity anymore, at least the types of investments we were doing. And so it was losing some of its interest for me. So is growth equity a part of private equity? I would put it under the private equity umbrella, but there's this interesting thing with growth equity. So it was an asset class that was in invented back in 1980s. When it was first invented, it was like your TA Associates and Summit Partners and General Atlantic that invented it. And the asset class was actually like very specific to, hey, these are founders who bootstrapped a company. They grew it for five years. All of their net worth is tied up in this company. Let's put some money in their pocket, let them take chips off the table. We'll own two thirds of the company, a third of the company, whatever it is. And we'll help them grow it, you know, three X or 10 X or whatever for the next, you know, five year period. So growth equity previously wasn't like a, a venture type company that you need to like put money behind to grow. It was like, it was, it literally meant like, this is a company that's already successful, but the only reason why a founder wants to work with you is because they need to like de-risk. Over time, that asset class has changed to, I think, what people typically think of growth equity today, which is like, oh, you know, it's basically a venture company, but doing well, right? Yeah. Proven that there's like a market for this, um, which is what I would say probably 80% of the market today does growth in that way yeah. versus like some, it still looks for businesses that probably don't need an investor, but want an investor so that they can put some money in their bank account. Well, so then the way that it's thought about now is just after like growth or late stage VC investing, people now just refer to growth equity as just like the next- Bigger stage. check. The yeah, bigger check. check of VC. I see. I see. Yeah. Um, what was your MBA application like? Did you apply to multiple schools? Overall, thumbs up, thumbs down, good, bad? I feel funny saying it because it always feels like a little presumptuous. I actually didn't put a ton of time into it. Mm -hmm. And I think I had pre-planned a little bit, right? Because I took the GMAT back in 2017. I wrote my essays. Uh, I applied to just Harvard and Stanford. I wrote my essays on a weekend, took the week, thought about it, didn't like them, rewrote it the next weekend, and that was it. Um, so that was my application process. It wasn't super long, but I felt really good coming out of it, particularly Stanford's yeah. application. Like Harvard, I was kind of like, I don't know, like, I don't, I'm not really sure. I'd like I can't, what's their question? It's like, um, what else should, what we, else should we know? I was kind of like, I don't, I don't know. I, that's a little bit harder for me, but I actually felt like when I finished Stanford's essay, it was a really cool experience of, 
I don't even care if I get in. This is this is me. Um, and at the end of the day, I mean, I do care that I get in, obviously. But it was kind of like this. Um, hey, like if this isn't if this isn't what Sanford's looking for, I'm okay with that because this is actually who I am, and and that's what I care about. Yeah, I had a similar realization. Uh, my application process was like three, four, five times. <laughs> it took me a couple months to work on my application, but I think at the end of it, as I like submitted the final essay, like. I put my best foot forward and I was like, this is me, like all of me, like on the table, like take it or leave it. Totally. Like, if you don't want it, like that's cool. Like maybe I'm not like Stanford enough or Harvard enough or whatever it is, but I'm like, that's who I am. Yeah. And, and I would even say like the, you said Harvard enough or Stanford enough. Yeah. I think so much of it is luck. And it's crazy that there's like this massive luck involved because you look at something as impactful as Stanford for the rest of our lives. And it's like, you would hope that there's no luck involved, but there's like, there's so many other chads mm. who've done great things like me <laughs> and like, <laughs> and especially in finance, right? Like there's a bunch of chads. In we got to talk about it. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> uh, and, and I just think like, be grateful for where you end up. And at the end of the day, like if you don't end up at Stanford or Harvard or Wharton or any of these awesome schools, like there's so many of them, um, life goes on, like back to the, the original thing we talked about, right? Like yeah. things are okay. You'll realize in five years that certain opportunities weren't going to be available to you if you went down one of those paths and hopefully you're grateful for them. Yeah. What about your recommenders? I had both of my managing directors, partners at Summit Partner, Summit Partners, write my letters. I worked with them a ton and every single deal I did at Summit was with them. I'm pretty sure they wrote it in like a weekend. <laughs> um, and like, it would be naive of me to think that I would have gotten in without those people. And I, I didn't come from a background of like a bunch of connections in my own right. I think what I've come to realize is I almost felt guilty in some ways of like, oh, I probably wouldn't get into Stanford if it wasn't for these great people in my life who put their foot forward. But then I realized I was like, you know, these people only are putting their foot forward because I did well for them. Mm -hmm. And so now they feel like they can champion me. Um, and that would be sort of my advice for most people is like, do if you do well at the places that you're at, you sort of come into a, a position of having other people who have that access and who, who have those relationships to be able to, you know, put their foot forward for you. Yeah. That helps you out getting into the school that you want to get into. What advice would you give people who are applying right now? I loved, and I would hope that everybody does this, even if you're not applying to Stanford, I think you should like go through the effort of figuring out what's most important to you. Sit down and like think about who you are to reflect on, not like numbers wise, what you've accomplished, but more like, who are you? Who are you as a person and like what are you doing here on earth for like a hundred years? Yeah, for like a hundred years. Like what are you what are you hoping to get out of it? Why do you want to get an MBA? Like what what is important to you in your life that's like very unique to you? Mm -hmm. What surprised you most about this last year? How little I feel like I value the classes and how much I value the impromptu relationships mm -hmm. uh, that I have with people. I think you go into your MBA and you're like, oh, trust that, you know, sometime over your career, it'll pay itself back. It's already paid itself back for me. And we haven't even left, right? Something that excites me about being here at Stanford uh, is just the people and the relationships we have. The next question was, what's your favorite class <laughs> that I wrote down? But I, 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 I might, host, I, <laughs> I mean, we can go with it. I, I would have to think about that for a second because most of the time, Hannah, so my wife, Hannah, she came back from like some moms uh, get together mm -hmm. with other MBA moms. Somebody had asked the question like, oh, what's what, you know, what classes Chad enjoying this semester, or this quarter? And she was like, I don't even know any of his classes. So she came back and asked me like, hey, what are you taking right now? I was like, well, there's a reason you don't know them because they're not that interesting this quarter. One class that I really liked uh, was the Essentials of Strategic Communication. I need to look up his name. This is the name of your professor? Yeah, he, he's like actually a really big deal. That class was really good because he would come in with like very specific things that you can do to present better and then we'd practice it. Whereas I feel like a lot of classes, again, it's like case study where you get to the end and you're like, okay, that was like interesting, but... What's the takeaway? Mm -hmm. How do I actually go out and apply this today? With him, like it was such simple stuff. Like when you're standing one foot slightly in front of the other, that ensures that you're not like moving your hips all the whole time. Stuff like that, that are techniques that you could probably find on YouTube, but you're learning from somebody who's very compelling in this. Mm -hmm. And I felt like coming out of that, it was like immediate. It's like, yeah, every time I present from here on out, I'm going to be doing that technique because it obviously works. 
Yeah, because now we're going through the class picking process again. Yep. Do you think it'll be better the second year? What did you choose? I'll ask you that first. Did you choose any for, have you already submitted for I did. this quarter? So um, I did my first round pass. It took me about like 40 minutes to do to be like, okay, what are the classes I actually care about? And then I think I'll have to do another pass to like reorganize them yeah. to be like, how do I be a little bit more strategic about like not taking 8 a.m.s? First one I put down is winning writing. I got that in Super Round. Oh, you did? Okay. Yeah. Well, actually, I'm excited for Super that. Round, I did Touchy Feely and MGE with Graham Weaver. Okay. You got him. Yes, the four credit wow. one. What was your rank with or your um, position? Three hundred something. Wow. Yeah. Cool. Um, what did you get for your two uh, I got winning writing. Got waitlisted for Graham Weaver. So thanks. <laughs> 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 Engineering a remarkable life with yep, Joel. Joel. Did you put that one down? I think it's number three okay. in the round one. Acting with power. Yep. Strategic communication. That is with Allison Kluger. Okay. I've heard her name. Yes, she's a famous professor. She does reputation management in the oh, spring. Oh, yeah. I'm glad we got, we got <laughs> into that, even though you said you're not into classes. I like talking about them. Yeah. Just hopefully, don't like sitting in them as much. Hopefully they'll be better the second yeah. year, is what people say. At first, when I was looking over autumn quarter, I was like, eh, are there that many that I'm excited about? The problem is I think the ones that I'm most excited about go in round one. There's only 66 classes, electives that we can choose from. Yeah. Which felt like it a felt, very small. I know. I said that to someone. I didn't else, realize and that. Like that's so many. And I, was I was going like, through. I was like, oh, the the list is over. Yeah. Like this is it. Should I make the clickbait title of this? Like he hates. The <laughs> <laughs> Up to you. I mean, Stanford's obviously going to see it. So, Chad, moving on to more life topics. Can you tell me what you are doing this summer? This summer, and actually for the last year, I've been building a business. A lot of my experiences in consumer, having a good time with it, and. Uh, wanted to start something in the supplement space. Most people probably are familiar. There's a brand called Athletic Greens. It's comprehensive nutrition in powder form. You mix it in a drink, stir it around, and then you choke it down because uh, it tastes terrible. I've tried that product twice and love the health benefits that you can get from it, but ultimately found that it's not portable, makes a mess on your counter and tastes really bad. So I decided I'm going to start a gummy version of it. Running that business right now, we actually just launched three weeks ago. And how's it going? It's going well so far. So the hype is really good. We are actually working with a lot of creators, getting authentic feedback. We just send the product around and see what people have to say. The feedback has been really, really strong. And so it's exciting to see, you know, strong feedback from customers, but also strong feedback from people who receive a lot of product and see them actually get like authentically excited about it. And also see the hypothesis I had about, hey, like, People don't realize how gross uh, those green powders are, like how hard it is to keep a habit that's disgusting, uh, like said said kind of bluntly. But it's really fun to see people, creators in particular, respond and say, you know, this is much more my speed. This is actually something I look forward to. Like you can authentically see them excited about taking their gummies. It's called Groons. Oh, I should grab it, yeah. <laughs> How did you come up with the name or like what was the like brainstorming around that? So I spent a lot of time trying to figure it out and I ultimately thought Grün would work. So Grün means green in German. Grüns with an S doesn't actually mean anything, mm. which is great for SEO. Mm. Uh, if you search Grüns right now, G-R-U-N-S, we would pop up because there's nothing else out there. It also makes it possible for us to trademark it because it's technically not a color. Um, so there's a lot of benefits to it being like close enough that you'd be able to see. And the smiley face is obviously cute. But with the umlaut? Yeah. Uh, is that so what it's called? Umlaut, yeah. And are you a solo founder? This time around, I am. Last business, I worked with someone. Awesome, awesome person to work with. This time, I felt like, based on the experiences I've had working with some really incredible consumer businesses and serving on the boards of those businesses, I felt like I had the expertise to to go forward. So for right now, it's me and one of our classmates, uh, Shadden, working on this, and we'll see from there. And the complaints I hear most often is, one, these green powders aren't portable, despite them even having some portable packs. You aren't going to like clean your bottle in the middle of nowhere. Um, and so it gets gross by the time you get home. Two, makes a mess on your counter. And three, it tastes really bad. So our gummies, unlike your typical supplement, which comes in like a 60 count bottle, every single one is pre-dosed. Take one single snack pack a day. You can take it wherever you want. When we ask people where they like to take them, it's actually like very distributed across breakfast, snack, uh, mm -hmm. dinners, between meals, whatever it is. People like them any, any time of the day. No one else is really doing yeah. like individually snack pack sized supplements. I had 
had greens for it wasn't my dinner but it was like part of my dinner <laughs> yeah <laughs> like i opened it up i put it on a plate and it was funny because it was like gummy bears on a plate yeah. and then another time i took it was in the car i love the portability of it mm. do you like the taste i love the taste <laughs> it's, it's so good <laughs> And they're all natural, so the dark green color. Yeah. Um, we don't artificially flavor or artificially color it, so mm. you're looking at the greens that are, in it, that are in it. Was it hard to develop like a formula or like a shelf stable? Harder than I thought. Yummy. So I actually wanted to launch this business back in November mm. of last year. The hardest part about launching a business like this is most manufacturers in the supplements industry are a little bit older so they're sort of like rooted in their ways they're not really hungry to try something new for this particular formulation there was a moment where i asked my manufacturer i said hey can we like put 30x the amount of content in this right and they were like that's going to taste terrible but ultimately i was like well let's just do it and let's let's then say what it tastes like mm. um and then ultimately came out and we all agreed like hey this is actually really good still let's run with it can you patent that? <laughs> you can't patent okay. formulations like this. You could probably patent certain ingredients if you're like inventing them. Mm. Ultimately, like people are going to copy us. Like it happens in consumer all the time. You're always going to have ankle biters uh, who can do all right for themselves. But like we're, we've got a good game plan to get this off the ground fast. I love that. Also, ankle biters. I've never heard that term, but it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. <laughs> Vicious word. Yeah. <laughs> if a creator wants to get involved with grooms what is the best contact and i can put it in the description yeah i would love to work with any creators so shadden uh one of our classmates she's awesome you probably want to talk to her more than me mm -hmm. uh because she's like super fun and uh, super really fun. <laughs> <You're> super fun. <laughs> thanks sheree mm -hmm. shadden's awesome so you'll probably reach out to us on instagram she'll hook you up with free product so right now with creators we'll send you free product our hope is that you love it enough to to share and we'll repurpose that as content and strike that long-term deal with you. Awesome. And I will include my like affiliate link. Yep. It's an affiliate link that comes with 20% back through Cherie's link. Yeah. Uh, if you click Use my it. link. It'll be in the description. Yeah. I awesome. always wanted to say that. Yeah. I well, know. now you've done it. Yay. And that concludes our Grin segment. <laughs> <laughs> I want to ask about having a family on campus and like what has that been like in the last nine months, seeing Axel grow up, balancing family and school and also the startup. Yeah. That was kind of a question. It was yeah. just kind of a series of statements. But you're spot on. It's actually the biggest thing that I wanted to improve on my life coming to uh, get my MBA. Sort of have faith that stepping back every single day at 5 p.m., I go downstairs, I hang out with Axel and Anna, period, until we put them to bed at 7. It's been really great. I've really enjoyed it. And I think it's also been awesome for Hannah, my wife, because historically especially during covid it was really hard to have friends that we would hang out with all the time whereas here amazing community i actually think hannah's going to be more bummed to leave than i will and I, i'm going to be bummed to leave but like she has a really good community here and i think for anybody who has a partner or a spouse i think that can't be understated the last part is called bills 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 where we're going to talk about how you're financing the mba experience how does that break down 100 percent debt <laughs> so 100% debt. And the reason for that is... Does that mean loans? Yeah. So I'm taking on loans and it is what it is. So in investing, typically you get cash bonuses at the end of a year. Mm -hmm. So most people who go through investing probably have cash bonus that they... Savings. Have savings and that they put towards this. In my situation, a lot of the bonuses that we got, we were able to put into the investments. So when I sourced deals and sourcing a deal is where you... You're the first to talk to the founder, you originate that opportunity, and then you end up closing an investment on that opportunity. Summit Partners, I don't know how much I can actually disclose, but they they essentially put money into that business for you as equity instead of like giving you a cash bonus. So I have a lot of money sitting in these investments and you know we're in the middle of this like downturn, not downturn, whatever it is, waiting for those investments to materialize and get that cash back out. But we have to like front load uh, mm -hmm. the debt while we wait for that money to materialize. Well, that might take time. like five to 10 years. Yeah, but it's already been like three. For people who are going through the financing process or thinking about MBAs, like, do you have any advice for them? Or like, how should they think about it? For people who are evaluating, like, should I take on debt? I would say as long as I would be careful about taking on a lot of debt, I don't think we would have done it. There was actually a moment I didn't, I wasn't going to come to Stanford because I felt like I don't want to take on that level of debt despite knowing that it'll get paid off in a few years. Like, I just don't feel comfortable. I grew up in a family where like 
even taking on like five thousand dollars of debt in my undergrad i felt very uncomfortable with and i didn't we paid it off in like four months it took a lot for me to get to that point where i was like okay we'll go ahead and do this um for this experience it's an investment it's true you don't really have to wait 40 years to like look back on your life and be like oh you know that three hundred thousand or whatever it is it's a little bit more for me because i have a family mm -hmm. whatever that amount is that it costs to be at at stanford like i don't think you have to wait so long to see the benefit of it yeah. i think it comes pretty fast okay thanks everyone for joining us on this episode of sharice corner with chad bye bye thank you <laughs> love it nice good stuff killed it you don't do the whole like camera hand thing <laughs> Thank you so much for tuning in for this episode of Cherie's Corner. Before we get into the takeaways, I need to give you guys some updates. First, please like, comment, and subscribe to get more up-to-date content just like this. Okay, so the biggest update is that season one of Cherie's Corner is coming to a close very soon. There's just a few more podcast episodes left. I'm thinking about creating Cherie's Corner podcast season two. If you have any strong feelings about this, please let me know in the comments. I'd love to hear from you whether or not I should make season two or not. The next big update is that I'm going to Japan for five weeks. I have a Stanford internship on a Japanese matcha farm. Yes, you heard that right. I'll be posting vlog content detailing what am I even doing in Japan? What is life on a matcha farm even like? and sharing my everyday life and learnings with you. I honestly have no idea what to expect, but I think it's gonna be an adventure and I have a really good feeling about this. And finally, I'd really appreciate if you could share Cherie's Corner podcast with someone who you think would find this information and podcast useful. Okay, let's get to the takeaways. The first big takeaway from this podcast episode with Chad is that he didn't love the MBA classes in the first year. The image we often see of Stanford is success stories or picture-perfect moments, but I'm really glad Chad was able to share his experience in his first year. His perspective might not be the most popular with Stanford administration, but it's real and it's important. Chad didn't really see or find value in attending the Stanford classes in the first year. Rather, he finds more value outside of the classroom with the network and friendships he's developed with classmates. For some more context there, a lot of the curriculum in the first year at Stanford Business School is required, meaning you don't really have too much flexibility in the first quarter or the second quarter to choose your classes. You do have some flexibility, but really there's a lot of required classes that you have to take and many students end up not being very happy about that. The second main takeaway from this conversation is balance. If I thought my life at Stanford Business School was kind of crazy and hectic, Chad has the ultimate balancing act of his family, his son, his startup, and classwork. Everyone has the same 24 hours in the day, and it's up to us to figure out how and what to prioritize. And the third main takeaway is that I love Chad's story about his pivot from finance into entrepreneurship. I often get the question on my social media about like how to pivot into product management, how to pivot into tech, how to get a job at a startup. Chad's career path is an excellent example of the just freaking do it mindset. His background is in finance, but he was able to figure out real problems and pain points and create a solution to address it. If you don't have startup or entrepreneurship experience, create your own. Make your own experience. What is a problem that you face in your life? Chances are, if you feel this pain point, other people feel it as well. Brainstorm a couple of ways to solve this problem. Talk to friends and family. Test it out. That's basically what startup founders and product managers do. Thank you guys so much for tuning in for this episode of Sharice Corner. I'll see you very soon. Bye!